Hello, welcome to Willow Hill and everyone joining us for worship today. We are so blessed to worship with you. My name is Lee Hager. I'm the director of online ministries and I'm excited to welcome you to another week of our sermon series, Haunted, the ghosts of life's past, present, and future. This week, Pastor Nicole is sharing the message, the ghost of the present. If you are new here, welcome. We're so glad you're here and we would love a chance to get to know you a little bit better. So please consider filling out the digital connection card, which is linked in the video's description, or you can scan that QR code on your screen. Like I said, it gives us a chance to get to know you a little bit better, and it's an opportunity for you to submit any prayer requests you might have so the staff can pray alongside you. If you are joining us from your television, we encourage you to pull out your cell phone or tablet and join us in the comments. We would love to engage with you there, hear anything you like, any insights you might have, and we also encourage you to like and share this worship service with someone you think might be blessed by it. If you'd like to get to know Willow Hill a little bit more, you can check out our website, willowhill.org, or you can find us on social media through Facebook, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Now, before we get into singing our opening song, we do want to provide a slight con content warning um, for today's message. There will be mention of mental health and suicidal ideation. So if that topic um, upsets you and you don't want to be listening to that, um, please stay through the worship service um, through the second song of today. Otherwise, please join us in lifting your voice as we sing our opening song.
Hi, friends. As we enter into our prayer time today, I'm going to give you just a couple of moments to pray whatever is heavy on your heart, um, and then I will pray a prayer for us. At the end, we will join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Let us go to God. Almighty God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, today we ask that you would Speak to each of us. Remind us of the work that you have called us to do. Prompt us to reach out in love and concern to our hurting world. Bring to our minds those persons who we need to be holding in prayer. Whisper to us the name of those we need to reach out to. Help us to share your love and compassion in this world. We have just seen the atrocities that are happening around our world, and it's so awful to witness, Lord. We pray that you would continue to inspire us to pray for peace, to be actively working towards peace in our world, to find ways that we can work to end uh, hatred and, and racism and all of these terrible things that we're seeing. Where there is violence, God, we pray for peace. Where there is hatred, we pray for love. And we ask that you would help us to be an agent of those things. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi friends, it is time for small talk. I want to talk today about times that sometimes we make bad choices and we know we're doing things that aren't very nice. Um, maybe we're messing up. Maybe we're not being very kind to someone. And sometimes we stop and wonder. We know we're doing something wrong. And we start to think, uh-oh, I know I shouldn't be doing this. I wonder if God still loves me. What do you think? Does God still love us when we're doing something wrong? You're right. God loves us no matter what, right? But sometimes we might not feel like it. Sometimes we might feel like we're just, maybe we're making bad choices. Maybe, maybe we're not good enough for God. Maybe we're sad or lonely and we just feel like, like we're really alone and God can't find us wherever we are. Sometimes we feel those ways. And there are people in the Bible, lots of stories in the Bible that tell us about people that either felt like they weren't loved by somebody else, felt like they weren't good enough, or knew they were making some bad choices, but just couldn't quite figure out how to stop doing it. And there's lots of stories in the Bible where Jesus found people like this and Jesus helped them realize that no matter what, God loves them. God loves every one of us, every one of you, no matter what. And then sometimes these stories in the Bible, when people realized how much God loved them, that Jesus would spend time with them, even if other people wouldn't, even if they were making bad choices or doing bad things, Jesus still wanted to spend time with them. 
sometimes that helped people realize that because God loves us so much, we don't have to keep worrying so much. We can do our best to make better choices, to love and care for other people, to love and take care of ourselves even. Because no matter what, God loves you. And that is one of the best things about this book here, the Bible, right? The Bible is filled with stories and information that help us learn how much God loves us. There's stories about all different people that have lived, that have made mistakes, um, that have wondered if they were good enough, and people that God has helped learn, that Jesus spent time with, to help them learn how much God loves them. And we at Willow Hill think it's so important that everyone can read and learn these stories from the Bible, that we like to give Bibles every year to our kids who are in third grade. So today at Willow Hill, we're going to be giving out Bibles to kids who are in third grade or kids a little bit older that haven't received a Bible from us yet. So if you're out there watching on your TV and you are third, fourth, fifth grade, maybe even sixth or seventh grade, and you've never received a Bible from a church before, would you just reach out to us at Willow Hill? You can um, write a message, have your parents write a message under the, under the video, have them write a message on Facebook or email, and we will find a way to get you your very own Bible so that you can read and learn more about Jesus, more about the people that God loves, including us, and you can learn more about how much God loves you no matter what. Let's put our hands together and we'll say our sentence prayer this morning, okay? All right, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving us no matter what we do. Help us use our Bibles to learn more about your amazing love. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next time. Our mission statement here at Willow Hill is to gather people in the name of Jesus, to grow disciples and equip them for personal ministry, and to go into our community and world to share the transforming love of God, transforming power of God's love. As we think about that mission statement, it is what we want to do with every bit of Willow Hill's energy, everything that we want to do, we want to do around that mission statement. And we are only able to accomplish anything through your generosity. Because when you give to the mission and ministry here at Willow Hill, you are helping to make our mission statement happen. You're helping us to reach out and serve our community and our world, to love others, and to grow personally in our own faith. And so we are so grateful for all the ways that you continue to support the ministry here. We invite you to give today online. You can do so by using the QR code on your screen. There's also a link in the description of this video. If you'd rather drop a check by the church office or mail it in, you can do that as well. But know however you give, you are making a difference and we are grateful.
Let us pray. O oh God, we pray that you would open our ears, that we might hear your still, small voice. Speak to us, God. We are listening. Amen. Well, do you ever have memories just kind of pop into your mind, just kind of randomly? It may not even be like a significant memory, but for whatever reason, it just finds its way into your thoughts more often than you expect it to. I don't know why, but one of those memories that pops into my head every few months dates back to my time in middle school. When I was in middle school, uh, my Sunday school class convinced our teacher that we needed to film a movie during our Sunday school time. So each week we would come with costumes and a rough, and I mean rough, script and an excitement that I just can't explain. It was a big deal for us and we were just so excited about it. I was cast as the character of the ghost of the present. And the movie we were shooting, of course, was A Christmas Carol. Oh, friends, if I could locate a copy of that movie, I would be equally proud and horrified to show it to you. <laughs> it consumed our time for several weeks uh, during Sunday school. But you probably know this story, right? Old Ebenezer, a miser, an unfriendly, selfish, uncompassionate man. His worst quality, though, he hated Christmas. I mean, can you believe that? Like, who hates Christmas? Ebenezer Scrooge. Well, as the story goes, Ebenezer was haunted by the ghost of his former business partner, Jacob Marley. And Marley came to warn Scrooge that the life that he was living was going to lead to a terrible afterlife where he would be forced to carry around the heavy chains of his misdeeds and his unkindnesses. Beginning at midnight that night, Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by three more ghosts. The ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas yet to come. It is these three ghosts that inspired our current sermon series, Haunted, the Ghosts of Life's Past, Present, and Future. Last week, we talked about the ghosts of our past, and today we're talking about the ghosts of our present. And since I once embodied the ghost of the present in that fine middle school production, <laughs> I think I must somehow be uniquely qualified to speak on this topic. At least that's what I'm telling myself. <laughs> when Scrooge gets a visit from the ghost of Christmas present, even though the ghost is quite jolly looking, it isn't exactly a pleasant experience for him. He's taken to the home of his employee, Bob Cratchit, where he has to observe this meager holiday feast that they have, and he's introduced to Bob's handicapped son, Tiny Tim. And Scrooge realizes that Tiny Tim might not survive the year and perhaps has a little bit of a pang of guilt around that. Then he's taken to his own nephew's house, where he overhears how hated and how pitied he is because of how he clings to money and pushes people away. By the time the ghost leaves Scrooge back in his bed, he has a lot to think about. Ebenezer Scrooge often reminds me of a biblical character, one that we find was also haunted by the ghost of his present. He too was a wealthy man who was disliked by his community. So today we're going to take a look at the story about a man named Zacchaeus. So we're going to take a look at Luke 19 verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through town. There was a man named Zacchaeus, a ruler among tax collectors, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he couldn't because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. 
When Jesus came to that spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down at once. I must stay in your home today. So Zacchaeus came down at once, happy to welcome Jesus. Everyone who saw this grumbled, saying, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and, I have, and if I have cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household because he too is a son of Abraham. The human one came to seek and save the lost. I think we can best sum up this story like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree, for the Lord he wanted to see. <laughs> oh, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus. We've sung about this fella since we were little, right? We learned that song when we were growing up in Sunday school or at vacation Bible school. But who exactly was Zacchaeus? Well, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, but not just any old tax collector. He was the chief tax collector. And you know what that means? He wasn't just hated. He was super hated. He was the chief tax collector. He was an extortionist and a collaborator with Rome. He was a professional traitor. No one liked Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus was a terrible person. He chose a job that swindled money out of his neighbors. And he did it under the guise of the oppressive Roman government. Everyone hated tax collectors. One commentary I read pointed out that there was guidance from rabbis at the time that it was permissible to lie to tax collectors so that you could protect your property. If rabbis are telling you that you can lie in order to spare you from the greed of tax collectors, you know it's a bad situation. And Zacchaeus was on the wrong side of things. But really, in the grand scheme of things, we don't know a lot about Zacchaeus. We don't know where he grew up or what kind of family he came from. We know he had a household, but we don't know who made up his family. We don't know how long he had been a tax collector. We really don't know very much about him. But, as Pastor Fred Craddock wrote, no one can be privately righteous while participating in and profiting from a program that robs and crushes other persons. In other words, Zacchaeus knew what he was doing. He knew that he was profiting off of the hard work of others. He knew he was benefiting from this cruel and oppressive system. And all of his neighbors saw it. They saw it all. His neighbors watched as he grew richer and richer off of their hard work. Theologian N.T. Wright shares that Zacchaeus' neighbors saw how his house became more lavishly decorated, how more and more slaves were added to his household, how he had finer clothes and richer food. Zacchaeus' community saw all of that. They knew it was their money that was providing for this luxurious lifestyle. And Zacchaeus knew that they knew what was going on. And I bet that haunted Zacchaeus. Surely the ghost of Zacchaeus' present haunted him as he lived in a community where people hated everything about him and everything that he stood for. And that's why I think Zacchaeus is a lot like Ebenezer Scrooge. These guys were two peas in a pod, two men who valued wealth over people, Two men who profited off of the misfortune of others. Two men who were more lost than they realized. Two men who were haunted 
by the ghost of their present. I wonder if you've ever felt like that before. If you ever felt haunted by your present. Have you ever been paralyzed in fear because of a situation you found yourself in? Maybe it's financial debt. Maybe it's an affair. Maybe it's a dark secret that you're really trying to keep buried. Maybe it's a bad decision that got you into this place that you are right now. All of these situations can lead us to feel like we are haunted by our present. All of these situations can feel, make us feel overwhelmed and terrible. But maybe what's haunting you isn't something you did wrong. Maybe it's something different that's haunting you, like anxiety or doubt, or fear of the unknown. Maybe it's depression or another mental health issue. There are all sorts of situations where we might find ourselves overwhelmed by our present circumstances, so overwhelmed that we just don't know what to do. When we find ourselves in situations where we are haunted by our present, we need to reach out for help. That's exactly what Zacchaeus did. Surely he had heard about this Jesus guy. And something about Jesus intrigued him enough that he decided to climb a tree. Something drew him to Jesus. And I have to wonder if that something was that he wanted help. He didn't want to keep living like he was. He didn't want to keep being hated by his community. He didn't want to be known solely as the chief tax collector anymore. And so he reached out for help from this guy named Jesus. Sometimes, like Zacchaeus, we find ourselves haunted by the ghost of our present situation and we need to reach out for help. Now, there's lots of different places that we can do just that. We can reach out to a friend, a family member, a pastor, a counselor, a therapist. There are times in our lives when we are so overwhelmed that we must ask for help. I want you to hear from one of our members here at Willow Hill. He also happens to be one of our staff members. He's had an experience with some people reaching out for help, and I wanted him to share his story with you. Let's take a listen. Hello, my name is Joshua Atkins. I serve as Director of Hospitality with Willow Hill United Methodist Church. And I'm going to share a few things with you today. I got involved with the suicide hotline, 988, used to be 211, because I was looking for something to volunteer with. Maybe I could learn a little bit about me and see if I could also help others. So as a volunteer operator, what my role was, it's kind of two things to assist people who have, you know, needs. Let's say you may be low on the light bill or something like that and you need resources. Another thing I specialized in or what all volunteers do is people who just need a little bit of talking or maybe some suicidal ideation help. What I find is, you know, there usually is a straw that breaks the camel's back, but it's multiple straws. So that's kind of what 988 is about, is providing those resources and someone to help you eliminate those little things. And if you're in, a series or a mode of crisis to have someone that can help you and kind of talk you through it and build an action plan. A lot of people, when they called in, they were a little concerned thinking, oh, they're gonna record all my data and I'm gonna go to jail or get locked up in a facility. No, it's not about that. Now, if there's something that goes on that you're in progress or something, that's kind of what we say. Yes, those are type of things that we might have to identify if the police would be called. But for the most part, these are situations where someone might call in, it could be regularly, just to talk just to check in. This is something where they feel that they don't have a resource, something that there's no one around them. This could be, for example, I've had a gentleman who was a little bit older, his wife passed, and he did call in multiple times throughout the week just to check in, just to talk. And a lot of that was kind of rehashing the same old things, but it helped him work through that grief. So it could be very serious situations like that, or it could be just, you know, something's going on at school. 988 is a service for suicide ideation, but for most important, it's a resource to kind of help you 
with the grips of life. And I think what's the most important thing to realize is everyone needs a little helping hand, okay? It, there's no shame in that, but if you don't go out and ask for it or get that help, you're gonna have struggles that are unimaginable. And that's kind of what I've really learned about 988 is not only figuring out that it's not shameful, there's something that everyone needs help with, but knowing that there's someone there to listen. And sometimes that's all people needed is just someone to listen to them, not necessarily building an action plan or steps, just to hear them, the whoever you are. You can come to 988, tell your story, we're there to listen, help, and if we need an action plan, we can build towards that. And then that safety, that sanctuary, you know, you can find that in the church, but some people gotta start other places. And that's kind of one of the benefits of 988. It's somewhere to start, and you can really kind of get yourself on track. And even if you fall off the wagon, everyone does it. Let's get you back on track. Let's try to get something going, and we're here for you to help. So if you need help, please reach out. I find Joshua's story of volunteering at a suicide hotline fascinating. There have been some Sundays where Joshua has come to work here at Willow Hill straight from volunteering the night before. And I've asked him how he could do that without enough sleep. And he always responds, Pastor, I'm just trying to serve the Lord and help people. You know, I'm so grateful for people like Joshua who volunteer to help those who need it the most. And I just want to say that if you ever feel hopeless, please reach out for help. Please know that you are loved, that you are precious to God, and that we need you here. Help is available. If you ever get to that point of hopelessness, please call the suicide hotline. It's 988 and there will be somebody on the other end of that line to help you. You know, there's no shame in asking for help. In our culture, there's a stigma around the idea of therapy. Like there's something really wrong with you if you need a therapist. But that's just not true. Many of us, maybe even most of us, would benefit from seeking help from a therapist when we need it. You know, we all have situations in our lives that we could benefit from being able to talk it out in a safe, caring environment. Therapists are lifesavers and really just all-around superheroes, if you ask me. They can help us move past being haunted by our past or our present or even our future. If you think you need a therapist and don't know where to start, please reach out to me. I would be honored to help you start the process of finding the right person for you to talk to. You know, I think we can learn a lot from Zacchaeus. Even though he made some poor life choices, those choices didn't move him outside of the reach of God. His choices didn't move him outside of God's love or grace or forgiveness. Zacchaeus reached out for help and Jesus met him right where he was. Jesus didn't shame him for what he was doing. Jesus didn't condemn him for working with the Roman Empire. Jesus didn't turn his back on him because he was a sinner. Instead, Jesus changed Zacchaeus' life. He made his way into Zacchaeus' home and into his heart. Jesus, in his love, enveloped Zacchaeus in such a mighty way that Zacchaeus stopped being haunted by the ghost of his present. His hardened heart was softened. Jesus changed Zacchaeus' life forever. So if you're feeling haunted by your present circumstance. Know that you are not alone. It can be really overwhelming and scary sometimes, but just think of what Jesus might do for you. He changed Zacchaeus' life, and he can change your life too. Jesus isn't waiting to condemn you or to shame you for what you're doing. He's waiting to offer you help, to offer you a change. 
So invite Jesus in. He can vanquish the ghost that is haunting you by shining his love and his forgiveness and his grace into your life. Nothing you've done is too bad. Nothing you've done is too unforgivable. Nothing you've done is beyond transformation. He can change everything. He can change you. So may we learn from people like Zacchaeus and even Ebenezer Scrooge. May we know that we don't have to be defined by our less than ideal circumstances. Instead, we can allow ourselves to be defined by the love and grace of Jesus so that we might banish those ghosts that haunt us. Would you pray with me, please? Oh God, we are grateful to know that no matter what we're going through right now, you are with us, that you will meet us right where we are, that you will give us help when we are in need. Help us to know that you're with us, that we're not alone, that we can make a change, that we can change the circumstances that we're in. Help us to find the help that we need, whether it be through a therapist or a family member or a friend or whoever that might be, and help us to rely on you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, you know, there is nothing that you can do to make God love you less and he loves you right now. There's also nothing you can do to make God love you more than he does right now. So take that with you and know whatever your situation is, you can reach out to God and God will meet you with his great love. This worship service has ended, but your life in Christ goes on and on. May your peace be so real and your joy so evident that all who see you come to know God. Amen.